we shall be going over drugs that are used as anticoagulants. What we're going to go over in this lecture series is actually going over the, a brief overview of the clotting cascade, not in great detail uh, compared to the full lecture that we have on the site, but just key highlight points and kind of walk you through why drugs that we use for anticoagulation uh, work the way they work. All right, so the first drug we shall be talking about is heparin. But before we talk about heparin at all and its mechanism of action and how it anticoagulates, let's get a brief overview of how blood clot actually forms. All right, so I'm going to oversimplify this, okay? Blood clotting is really easy. All right, so. So this is a typical blood vessel, all right? And I'm gonna list exactly everything as they're going in order. So in order to form a clot in the body, let's give a perfect example. You cut your hand and you start to bleed, right? You expose the skin and collagen is exposed, all right? So the overall job of the body is to prevent you from bleeding out. Then patient develop hemorrhagic shock. So in order for that not to happen, the body has platelets, okay? So platelets are like little tailors, okay? They sew, they're like a little sewing machine. And they basically go to the spot and they try to come together as little plugs, okay? They stick together, all right? To kind of protect the skin that's broken or whatever part of the body that is bleeding, whether an organ or any or orifice, anywhere it is, because there are blood vessels there, they try to clog up. And then there's fibrin, Okay, but before fibrin can be made, we need coagulation factors. And these coagulation factors are going to coagulate, all right, stack up, and then eventually the end result is to get fibrin, all right, which is a nice little mesh that's going to sit on top of the platelet, and you form a clot. That's actually clot formation in English. Oh, wow. Whew. If somebody just explained that in all this while, and I got to go through all these pathways and Oh, yep, that's why we're here, guys. So let's have some fun. So remember those two things, platelets and coagulation cast, uh, factors to make fibrin. That is our end goal, and we make a nice little ball of clot, and we prevent you from bleeding. That's how your body protects yourself. So this is a blood vessel, all right? And inside the blood vessel are endothelial cells. This is an endothelial cell. That's an endothelial cell. This is an endo endothelial cell. Now, endothelial cells have a lot of things they can do. But when there's a damage, all right, to an endothelial cell, you expose the basement membrane. And in the basement membrane, there is collagen. These are the endothelial collagen. Now, this collagen, as soon as it's exposed, von Willebrand factor is secreted by the endothelial cell. That's one of the things endothelial cells secrete, okay? Once von, von Willebrand factor is secreted, they're gonna stack up right there and bind to collagen. So that is why I drew von Willebrand factor, okay? Now, as soon as von Willebrand factor is bound to the collagen, platelets are going to bind to von Willebrand factor with the protein, glycoprotein 1B, all right? That's the glycoprotein 1B. It's gonna bind to a receptor on the von Willebrand factor. Now this is a platelet, all right? This is a platelet, and the platelet, once they're activated, they're gonna secrete adenosine diphosphate. Adenosine diphosphate is basically like a perfume that tells all the platelets, wait a minute, I found a spot that's leaking in the blood vessels, we gotta get to work. So adenosine diphosphate is gonna be secreted, all right? And all the platelets are gonna hear the message and adenosine diphosphate is gonna bind to them. And what it does is stimulates platelet aggregation. It tells them to all come together. However, in order for them to come together and stick together and stay together, glycoprotein 2B slash 3A has to be made. So inside the platelet, these glycoproteins are secreted, all right? And they form these nice little receptors on the outside of each uh, platelet. Now, what happens in order for them to join together, 
fibrinogen, which is actually made inside of a platelet. See that? That is fibrinogen. It's made also inside of the platelet. And this fibrinogen is what's going to keep the two glycoprotein 2B and 3A together. All right. That's platelet adhesions. Now they have adhesed to each other. And now you've got a platelet here, another platelet here. Now there's also thromboxin A2 that's also made from the arachidonic acid from the membranes of the platelet. Thromboxin A2 also allow for platelet aggregation. Okay. So thromboxin A2, all right, adenosine diphosphate, this all help in platelets to kind of come together. Now, the end result is now we've got, we've got a bunch of platelets that are stuck together. So let's assume we've got von Willebrand factor st stuck to collagen. And now we've got all these platelets that are stuck together. All right, this is just an analogy. Now you see all those platelets? It's the primary hemostatic plug. It's not stable, okay? We need a huge mesh to stack on top of it to keep it strong. So when blood is moving with turbulent fluid, it doesn't run, you know, push away the debris of platelets and then we start to bleed again. So what the body does is create coagulation cascade. And this coagulation cascade is pretty easy, all right? It starts with factor 12 in the intrinsic pathway. If you want to learn a whole lot of detail, just go back to our lecture on the clotting cascade, coagulation cascade, and you see this in full details. But this is pharmacology. We want to dive down into the drugs that's inhibiting stuff here, okay? So we have factor 12, which is converted to factor 11, and factor 11 is converted to factor 9. Factor 9 is eventually converted to factor 10, and factor 10 is converted to factor 2. Now, in order for factor 10 to be converted, you can see a factor 8 actually converts factor 9 to factor 10, and factor 5 converts factor 10 to factor 2. Now, in actual reality, these factors have been activated. For example, factor 8A is going to actually work on this, 9 to convert to 10, and factor 5A, okay, 5A is actually what converts factor 10 to factor 2. As you can see here, there's a number 7 at the bottom of Factor 10, that is the extrinsic pathway, okay? And this extrinsic pathway uses tissue factor, and factor 7 is converted to factor 10 and eventually to factor 2. Now, what I want you to, note, what I want you to notice is factor 2 is also known as thrombin, from the word thrombus. Huh, that's pretty easy, right? A protein that's going to form a clot. Well, that's going to be the final pathway. Thrombin is actually factor 2, and it has to be activated to factor 2A, actually which is going to cause fibrinogen, fibrinogen, ogen, anytime you hear ogen in medicine, it's an inactive enzyme to form fibrin. Now, fibrin is just like a cloth, okay? It's a nice little mesh. And this fibrin, its final pathway, it's kind of come over this platelet. See that? It's a nice little fibrin meshes to stack right on top of the platelet. And we're gonna need some calcium and also factor 13 also to be able to cause this to actually happen i'm not gonna go into great details but that's what's gonna cause the fiber so this is the fibrin mesh so can you see the final common pathway i told you earlier i told you we need platelets and fibrin and all this complicated pathway is just to get these blood vessels from bleeding out now we're going to talk about heparin and which part of this pathway does heparin go into because see we form a clot but we want to use a drug that prevents us from forming a clot okay so the mechanism of action of heparin is it acts as a cofactor for the activation of antithrombin who wait a minute a cofactor which means it's gonna aid for activation for activation of anti-thrombin. Well, wait a minute, we've talked about thrombin. Where's thrombin? Hmm, I saw thrombin right there. Oh, wow. Thrombin is the final common pathway in the coagulation cascade that we need to activate fibrinogen into fibrin. So there is an enzyme that goes against thrombin, which is gonna bind we're going to call it anti-thrombin. 
all right? So what heparin does is it has like a cofactor. So let's draw it out. So we know that this is usually the common pathway, right? We have factor two, which is prothrombin. Actually, factor two is prothrombin, which is activated into factor 2A, which is thrombin. And this is going to activate fibrinogen, fibrinogen into fibrin. And remember that fibrin is that nice little mesh that we're dying to make, but we're going to need some calcium and it's factor 13. A to be able to activate this fibrin. So we're going to need an enzyme. So let's say this is thrombin. We're going to use an enzyme called antithrombin to bind to thrombin. So let's say it binds over here. Once it binds to thrombin, it's going to prevent the activation of fibrinogen to fibrin, which means if we don't have fibrin, this primary hemostatic plug is eventually going to fall apart and then we cannot have blood clot. Also, so that decreases the amount of thrombin that's available. That's basically what the effect is. So it's a cofactor. So what heparin does is heparin is going to come over here. Let's take heparin. All right. That's heparin. It's going to act as a cofactor. All right. Gonna act as a cofactor with antithrombin. So we decrease the amount of thrombin, we decrease the amount of clot formation. It's also going to decrease factor 10A. This is factor 10, okay? Factor 10 is usually eventually converted to factor 10A. And once it decreases the amount of factor 10A, that's another it's another mix, decreasing decreases factor 10A. Wait a minute. That's a big deal. If I don't have factor 10A, I can make thrombin. If I can't make thrombin, I can't make fibrinogen, I can't make fibrin. I can make a nice mesh. I cannot form a clot. That is the mechanism of heparin, and its job is to form an anticoagulant, an anticoagulant. So what do we, why do we anticoagulate patients? So on the boards, they're going to test you on this. What clinical So what's heparin used for? Well, heparin is used for immediate anticoagulation for pulmonary embolism huh wait a minute anticoagulation for pulmonary emboli what's pulmonary embolism so usually patients develop blood clots that goes to their lungs. Where did they normally come from? They come from the deep femoral vessels of the leg, the deep, vein, the, the, the deep veins on the leg, usually the proximal aspect of the leg. So what happens is patients that have recent surgery, they're immobile, okay, they have cancer because they have hypercoagulable state because their blood is predisposed to stasis from the Virchow's triad, right? Stasis, anticoagulation, and endothelial damage. They're predisposed to pulmonary embolism. Usually somebody has a knee surgery that's been sitting around for a long time. And remember, our veins are very compliant. They, they don't want to push blood back to the heart. The only way we're getting blood back to the heart from our legs is because the muscles of the legs are squeezing and they're shooting the blood up into our heart, into the right atrium. Well, that's our preload. Here's the problem. If there's stasis in these blood vessels, they start to stack up and then they form a blood clot. Now this blood clot, when they get big, they can go into the lungs and they cause the patient to become short of breath. When you become short of breath, you become tachycardia, you develop tachycardia, and then you develop hypoxia, right? Because a blood clot is blocking the pulmonary vessels and there's no oxygen. Let's take a look, quick look at that. So this is, this is an alveoli, okay? And these are blood vessels that are inside the lungs. If a blood clot comes over here, a huge blood clot, called no, usually a saddle embolus, comes and block this blood vessel. 
Now, when blood is trying to flow through, it can't, all right? Because there's a huge clot in the way, and oxygen is coming in to diffuse into the blood vessels, but then it's not, there's no blood going to this area of the body, so there's no, there's, there's no perfusion, but there's ventilation, so patients develop hypoxemia, okay? They develop hypoxemia because there's no blood flow to that area. They develop hypoxia eventually, and the patient gets short of breath. If it's a big clot that obstructs the pulmonary vessels and the, the right ventricle is trying to push against this large clot, there is a right heart strain and patient can go into either ventricular fibrillation or code. That is bad. So when the patient develops, if it's a smaller pulmonary embolism that's just going, like just blocking distal pulmonary vessels, patients that feel short of breath, is that from a long distance flight or whatnot. So in order to, pre you know, to basically uh, prevent propagation of more clot, you want to give the patient heparin so you can anticoagulate the rest of their blood. And what does it do? It decreases the amount of thrombin, activates antithrombin so that patients cannot form more clot, less fibrinogen, less amount of clot formation. That is the first indication that you need to know for using heparin. The second indication is acute coronary syndrome. Also now out acute coronary syndrome. Well, what's acute coronary syndrome? This is, this is a spectrum where we talk about myocardiac infarction, okay, or unstable angina. So what happens is you've got the heart, that's the heart, and there are blood vessels. Let's say this is the LAD, okay? And then we have the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending artery. Inside the LAD, when a patient has a plaque that ruptures, let's say this is a plaque, and the plaque ruptures and they get a clot on top of that, there's no blood flow to the distal aspect of the heart and the patient can develop myocardiac infarction. So if a patient develops ST elevation myocardiac infarction, you want to start them on heparin or if they're having uh, a non-STEMI, which is non-ST elevation myocardiac infarction, you want to immediately give this patient anticoagulant. So this is acute coronary syndrome, including which is evolution. So we use this because there's a whole spectrum of acute coronary syndrome because it's a dynamic process. So if you start hearing the word acute coronary syndrome, the, the end result is myocardiac infarction, but because there's stable angina, unstable angina, and then myocardiac infarction, and it's a whole spectrum. So the difference between, then there's ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI. This in collection are all known as acute coronary syndrome. Any of this, you have to give the patient anticoagulant, which is heparin. Also for deep venous thrombosis, known as DVT, deep venous thrombosis are those veins in the legs and patients develop clot in the legs, they're gonna need to be on heparin. The good news is we can also give heparin for a pregnant patient, why? Because heparin does not cross placenta, all right? So it can be used during pregnancy. Now how do we monitor heparin? Well, because it's the intrinsic pathway, See how long it is, it's pretty long because, you know, it's all this coagulation cascade that has to happen. You have to manage toward the PTT, the prothromboplastin time. The PTT, that's what you monitor in patients that are on heparin. So once the PTT number is high, that shows you the patient is well anticoagulated, anticoagulated. So make sure you remember that. Also, we're now going to talk about what is the toxicity of this drug. What are the side effects of heparin, right? So, this should be a no-brainer. The reason is because if I give you a medication that's going to prevent you from clotting, that's good, right? Because if you have a blood clot in your heart, oh, you get a heart attack. Ah, that's a myocardial infarction. That's not good, right? If you get a pulmonary embolism, you don't want the patient to become short of breath and tachycardic and whatnot. So their blood is going to be thin. Huh. If your blood is thin, if you accidentally bump your feet or your legs or you cut your scalp with a razor blade while you're shaving, what's going to happen? Uh, you're going to bleed. Yeah, that's right. You're going to bleed. That's right. So that's going to be a side effect. Why? Because your blood is thin. You're anticoagulated. So that's no-brainer. 
bleeding, okay? Even a little boy can tell me that, right? Your blood is thin, go figure out why you're bleeding because you're an anticoagulant, all right? Also, there's something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, H-I-T. This is a classic board question. If they ever want to test you on the side effect of heparin, you guarantee that they're gonna, they want to know, make sure you know by head. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. What does that mean? Heparin induces low platelet cytopenia. So usually the way they'll test you on heparin induced cyto induced thrombocytopenia is they'll tell you maybe a patient, they'll give you a patient of a clinical case of maybe a patient with deep venous thrombosis that's complaining of leg pain, leg swelling and redness, or a patient that's short of breath, you know, that's tachycardic and they have evidence of pulmonary embolism and they were started on heparin and then they'll show you a bunch of lab work and you look through the lab work and you see the platelet count is like 20. So you're like, hmm. That's pretty low. Hep, you know, platelets is usually 150 to 400,000, depending on which hospital, but usually you'll see it significantly low, maybe 40,000. You know something doesn't sound right. And they will ask you, what drug must have been caused this? The answer is gonna be heparin. Now, what is heparin induced thrombocytopenia? What happens is there's a formation of IgG antibodies, okay, against the heparin bound to platelet factor four, platelet factor four. This is actually the pathophysiology of heparin hit, okay? So there's a platelet factor four, and heparin normally binds to it, and there are anti IgG antibodies that are gonna now bind to this platelet. So let's, get, let's try to draw that on the board. So here's an antibody, this is a platelet with factor four. All right. And this is heparin. That's heparin, all right? That's bind to the platelet. So this is the platelet. So IgGs are going to bind to these platelets and when they cause binding, they're gonna cause thrombosis, all right? This IgG complex, so this antibody, which is the IgG platelet factor four with heparin, they all form this complex. And this complex causes thrombosis, which is a clot. Well, when you keep forming a lot of clots around your body, what's gonna happen? Your platelet count is going to drop. That's exactly why, okay? So that thrombosis leads to thrombocytopenia, all right? Now, another board question they like to test you on is heparin toxicity. You guarantee if they ever test you on this, you better make sure you get it right, because I'm gonna give you the answer right now. So let's, tell you, let's say they give you a patient that has heparin toxicity. What does that mean? It just means they had overdose of the drug, maybe the, 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 the weight of the molecule that was given was not according, because this is usually a weight-based drug. When the patient gets an overdose of heparin, they becomes, their PTT is very high and their blood is very thin. So what's gonna happen is, in order to reverse this, you have to give the patient protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate pro what protamine sulfate it's is actually a positively charged molecule and heparin is a negatively charged molecule so protamine sulfate is going to bind to the negatively charged heparin and neutralize it and decreases the toxicity of the drug so on the boards they love to test protamine so if you ever see protamine sulfate that is going to be your board answer and even on the wards answer for reversal of heparin. Now there's a few things I gotta tell you about heparin. There is a low molecular weight version of heparin because heparin is basically a molecule, okay? It's a negative charge molecule uh, that's created and it's a drug. So the low molecular weight heparin are known as x enoxaparin. Low molecular weight heparin enoxaparin and 
Dalty pairing. So if you hear enoxaparin and daltiparin, this is actually a low molecule. The size of the molecule is just lower. It's smaller. Okay. Now, this low molecular weight heparin actually acts more on factor 10. And remember, factor 10 is that midway between the entire coagulation of cascade. So they act a little bit more and they often give sub Q. So when you, when you, after you're done with your boards and you get in the hospital and getting excited, when you hear about patients with low subcutaneous heparin, that, that is, is low molecular weight heparin, and the patient actually have to inject it on into their skin into the subcutaneous layer. All right. Now the issue with that is this does not need to be monitored in the lab. That's the good news. You don't have to monitor their PTT or anything like that but they're not easily reversible. That is the only issue. But for the most part, it's pretty good and pretty safe. And they also have a longer bioavailability and they're, uh, they're two to four times longer half-life than the IV form, okay? So if a patient has a DVT, you can send them on, on a low molecular weight heparin and this is basically gonna protect them from forming a clot. Now, there are two other drugs that we can give if a patient develops hit. It's not like they got hit in the face, right? No, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So let's talk about those two drugs because on the boards, if they tell you we've got a patient, you know, has an acute coronary syndrome, you know, that was given heparin and the patient developed heparin induced thrombocytopenia, what other drug options do you have to treat this patient? So the two drugs is lepuridin, lepuridin, so if somebody's HIT positive, drug options, lepuridin, and bivaluridin. Bivalorudine, okay? These two drugs are your two next options for patients that have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It's an alternative. Now, this is actually derivatives from herudine. These drugs are both derivatives of herudine, and their mechanism of action is basically, uh, they're actually anticoagulants used by leeches. Ooh, leech. Oh, those are blood-sucking organisms, like animals, oh, like vampires. Well, they actually got from leeches, and they inhibit thrombin. That is their mechanism of action, okay? They inhibit their thrombin inhibitors. So if you inhibit thrombin, you can make fibrinogen, you can make fibrin, you can make that nice mesh on top of the platelets, and then you have anticoagulation. So those are the two drugs. Remember that. All right, so now that brings us to the end of heparin. The next drug we shall be talking about is gonna be warfarin.